Welcome to Entrepreneurship Talk with MSN. I am your host, Mrs. Simon Lovu. Today, I am joined by Ustandi Wemsomi, who is the founder and the CEO of two companies, guys. Uh, she runs uh, a company called Finance Gym and another one called Amasomi Production. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Standiwe, for blessing us with your presence today. Thank you so much for having me. I do want to uh, correct you there, though, before my colleagues come to bite me. I am actually the, the chief operating officer of the finance gym, not the CEO, the co-founder and CEO of the finance gym um, right. and CEO of Amasomi Productions. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so there you go, guys, to clear that out. Um, OK, yeah. thank you so much for being here. Uh, the first question, how did you guys start this business? How did, how mm. did it come about? What is the need that you saw in, in, in the market or in the world that people need to know more about education, uh, sorry, about finance? Mm. So the finance gym is definitely one of the ventures that I think has had a huge impact on people. And we only started operating last year around June or, or May, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but the feedback we've been getting from people about how they've learned so many different things has shown that Msibin's way to matters, you know. So um, quick story, a friend of mine that I was part of a organization called the Durban Youth Council back in 2016 with. Um, it's a group of just young people from different schools around Durban that get together every Wednesday. We used to get together at the Bad Center in, in by the harbor in Durban and we used to plan community projects. So I formed a good um, friendship with one of my colleagues named Osam Gelon Deta. Um, and he's been an entrepreneur right from, you know, after high school until um, now. Um, I'm obviously still a student, so I started the entrepreneurship game rather last year and so he approached me last year and he asked if I could actually speak at one of the events that um, the finance gym when it first started was curating and it was just a, an event to launch the finance gym they wanted me to speak about finances from a perspective of a student so I opted to speak and I, I gave my talk at the event it was online and um, it was an incredible event. People learned a lot from it. And then afterwards, he gave me another call and he said, would you want to, you know, to hop on as a co-founder and COO? And by that time, they were still trying to flesh out their idea as well and see what route they wanted to take. So um, at first, I was a bit nervous because I, I hadn't been, you know, fully immersed in the space of entrepreneurship. But I took the chance and I bet on myself and I say, OK, I think I have something to offer. Um, I, I am also a finance student at Vids. So so I see the need, I understand the context of our country and how um, financial literacy is key to, to growing our economy. So I thought, you know, let me take all of that and put it into this business. Um, and so that's how, you know, the finance gym really started. And so I've been working for the past, I think, eight to nine months with my two colleagues, Sam right. and Sile. Um, and we've been, we've been developing different types of content. Currently, all of our work is online. So you can go to our website and there we post blogs weekly um we're going to be launching very very cool stuff this week we're gonna, i mean this year sorry we're going to be launching um our online short courses for people to take as well as different shows on our websites and different platforms to really start a conversation about financial literacy because uh, it hasn't been a conversation that we've had in our community especially black communities because i think money has always been such a scarce resource so why talk about something if you don't have it you know so yeah. we definitely started you know creating those conversations and teaching um young people especially skills that they need to really ensure that their personal finances um are in order and for us to start building generations um that really take wealth building seriously so that's that that's really how you know the finance gym started started and i really can't wait for the new things that we start to roll out and then my second company amasomi productions is my production company that i started um actually at at the end of last year and I am someone who's very passionate about um, how society operates. I've always been someone to question the status quo and, and ask why are things a certain way and, and how can we change the narrative um, and tell our stories in our own ways and so my 
gifts. I, I really sat down and I say, okay, I said, okay, what am I skilled at? What am I good at? And a lot of that was writing. It was creating, um, speaking, and engaging with people. And that's 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 gifts and talents that God has given me. And so I took that and I first started a website called Candid Conversations, and it's one of the projects by Amasomi Productions. Um, and on there, we write weekly content um, that focuses on, on African development. So right from our economy to our politics, to societal norms, um, and, and touches on things like GBV, um, personal growth as well, and different types of content. Um, and it's just been growing strength by strength, partnering with different people as well who want to tell their stories on the platform. And hopefully, you know, as, as we grow as a company and as, as time goes by, we're able to produce more content such as talk shows and series or even movies that change the narrative in African societies um, and tell people stories that empower them, that lift them up, that force them to look at things in a different way, and hopefully um, also inspire other storytellers who are out there who want to also tell their stories. So those are currently my two projects. Wow. Yo, you yeah. are such a busy person, <laughs> eh? <laughs> you are very busy. Um, yeah, okay. hey. So I'm going to ask you first about the first company, which you mm. are a COO of. And then yeah. I'm going to ask you about the second company, Amasomine. So the first one, yeah. that one is always my, my concern, especially as you have rightfully said it, that as a black society, we are not very educated about money. And yeah. that for me is, is the biggest worry because I'm planning a total of 50,000 and two weeks, I don't have it. Like someone they want. So is that yeah. the need that you guys have seen? What are you seeing uh, that is happening in our society that you guys have seen that you know what? Let's let's address this issue of money and you know the problem of finances uh, mm -hmm. uh, around um, black society. Yeah, I think to uh, to answer your question adequately, um, we at the finance gym look at the macroeconomic perspective, um, because for for any economy to function and for our GDP to grow, um, all of the factors that go into our GDP also need to grow. And what we've noticed is that. Currently in South Africa, our savings levels are very, very low. An average consumer spends a lot of money purchasing products that have no return for them tomorrow or the day afterwards. And that actually affects how an economy gets to grow because um, if you study economic theory, you'll know that um, as consumer or household savings grows, it contributes to the growth of our GDP because the more people save, whether they put into a bank account or an investment account, the more there's actually capital to flow around for people to start businesses and for money to go in productive um, capacities and productive activities. And currently what's unfortunately happening in our country is that money is being diverted into just consumption itself. So people are buying clothes, buying food. And these are all things we need to survive, but those are not things that grow our economy. And so right. not saving and not taking, you know, not, not making financial literacy a priority doesn't just affect you, it affects the entire country. It affects the ability of our economy to grow, you know? So just from a macroeconomic perspective, that's the one problem that we at the finance gym have spotted. And we know that even though by by teaching people financial literacy skills, we're going to be empowering them. The bigger picture is empowering our entire society so that as people's saving grows, our, our economy grows, our GDP grows, there's a, a hospitable climate for people to start businesses, people can invest, and you know, hopefully the trickle-down economics of it leads us to a prosperous society um, mm -hmm. holistically. And then just on a personal level for your everyday your everyday consumer, the business, the, the biggest um, rather problem that we did spot is that people are unaware of how they can actually use their money. They're unaware of how they can use their money. They're unaware of how to make more money. They aren't aware of where to put their money. And so um, I always say knowledge is power. And if you don't have knowledge, you are powerless. And unfortunately, the powerlessness translates into just spending money into activities that have no direction or yield no return for you. And so our biggest thing has been trying to 
be an institution that disseminates knowledge to our communities and to change the, to change the way we approach money. I think for centuries on end, we have been a racial group that has been marked by a lot of, by a lot of lack and scarcity. And there's still that mindset of, you know, to make a lot of money, you need to either be this person or you, you need to do certain things or, you know, there's, there's no understanding of how the world actually pays you. And the world really pays you for the value you have to add you know, right. to, to the world. You, if you have a skill, you have a talent, you have, if you have an idea, that idea is exchanged in the marketplace for money. Um, but yet we still think that and, you know, to go to work and work hard and, and, and you know, I don't know, work tirelessly to make money. Yes, hard work is needed, but it's not about your time. It's about the value you have to add to the world. And that's what's going to, you know, get you that money. And so we need to, break those that understanding and, and create a new understanding of how if you have something of value to, to add in clubbing, you will get paid for that. And if you want to keep that money that you're you're being paid, you need to learn, you know, the markets and how to invest and, and when to invest and what to save in and how frequently how frequently you know you should invest. You need to learn simple things like you know creating a budget for yourself and even getting a financial advisor. Unfortunately, that's something that you know we don't you know make as a priority and we think we can all do it by ourselves but knowing that there are people and places that can help you and all you need is the knowledge to do that I think could be a big thing that could solve the financial illiteracy problem um, in our country and obviously I think um, I always say I wish we were taught financial literacy in high school or in primary yeah. um, because it's a life skill that we that we weren't taught. We were taught subjects that today we aren't using um, and, and the real needs of people to, to even learn simply how to use a tax-free investment account. That should be something you're taught, you know, in, in, in high school, but we're not. And so while we wait, you know, for government and our education department to change their policies and change their curriculum. I think we as individuals who are empowered and who, who have a bit of knowledge to share must really take that baton and pass it on to those that come behind us. So um, yeah, we at the finance gym definitely spend a lot of time um, doing research into what things like the savings index look like. Um, and then we use that to come up with solutions to meet you know, a consumer demand. Right. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. I have to ask you about the black tax. What do you think about black tax? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think black tax is a very, it's a double edged sword because yeah. on the one hand, it's very important to, to be, to, to express gratitude to those that yeah. have resulted in you being the person you are today. I honestly would not even be on this podcast with you if it wasn't for, you know, parents who cared about giving me an education and making right. sure I was fed and had clothes. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here, you know, if right. it wasn't for them. And so for me, I definitely think that we should never let go of our responsibility to, um, to thank those who um, have, have built us up. But in the same token, we must let go of the understanding that helping is necessarily money because sometimes a person doesn't need more money. They just need either more knowledge on how to use that money well, or they need other tools of empowerment because currently we live in a society that thinks like throwing money at a thing makes it better, but not realizing that yes, me, you know, paying or, or giving my parents money or my family money every month that's just one thing but the bigger question that, that I should be asking is why haven't we developed families that have people in those families individually that can create money for themselves mm. you know why haven't we empowered every single individual in our family and so black tax isn't bad but I think at the same time if you are an educated individual in your family you should definitely try your very best to almost transfer the, the knowledge that you have had to your brothers and your sisters and your, obviously our, maybe our parents and grandparents are too old for that. But for people who are in your age group, in your family, they should not just be looking at you as a successful one expecting money from you, but you should also teach them what you know and help them start their businesses and, as well. So that, you know, they won't have to be reliant on you for money and that they themselves have some sort of dignity. Because I guarantee you, 
there's no person who who feels empowered entirely if they keep on getting money from someone else every single month for their needs. There's a part of you that, that wishes ish as into, you know, as individuals, we all want that sort of autonomy. And so I think we should definitely invest in redefining black tax. I think the biggest black tax that we have is not necessarily giving money to our community. It's building up our communities. It's starting, wow. you know, your NPOs in your communities. It's starting the business in your community. That's the biggest black tax that we can pay because that's ultimately the tax that will pay off, you know, in years to come. Wow. Yeah. You know. You yeah, have just unpacked this so good that now, you know, to be honest with you, I've always thought about black tax as me giving money to my to my family or whoever. But now you've just made it so clear to me that it shouldn't be about money. It should be about a lot of things. It should be about the skill that you transfer to other people. And and yes. as and you are, as you are rightfully saying that saying it that. You know, our parents gave us education that they did not have. So now what is happening is they may not be able to grasp what maybe we can, you know, would want to give it to them, but we can give it to our siblings. We can give it to our yeah. cousins because that's where it starts. The minute now, you you, you, you know, you, you, you earn some money either from your business or from work, you, you then go back and 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 assist your siblings with money you pay for their school fees you 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 clothe them and all of that and all of that it weighs you a lot that you don't even get money for yourself so for you it's it, it's about going back and give them the skill then the money wow exactly. that's, that is exactly. very powerful. and even oh you know God. and even if even if you're paying for the fees of your younger sibling yes unfortunately if you don't pay your child your sibling won't go to school but don't don't end it there while you're doing that give your sibling little tools that they can use to start their own side business, whether they're selling chips at school or they're coming up with a new app, make sure that you're also teaching them and encouraging them to read books on entrepreneurship and self-enterprising so that even while you're paying for their school fees, you know that if ever anything has happened to you, they could pick themselves up and rebuild their lives because of the knowledge you gave them. My question that I have exactly about what you are saying is most of our black brothers and sisters they don't want to be educated about entrepreneurship that's the thing that's that's my problem actually you know i yeah. invested so much time trying to help people about about entrepreneurship but they just don't want to get it like they don't want to spend time reading the books that i share with them they don't want to spend time asking me questions about things I know that I can easily give them answers to. So how do yeah. we encourage our brothers and sisters at home, you know, to, mm. to, 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 get, to get a sense of, a, I don't know, is it a sense of belonging, you know, to, to, to want to own this entrepreneurship thing, to want to own this financial education because it's for their benefit. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree with you. It actually reminds me of a post that uh, an article I wrote for um, my, my blog, Candid Conversations. And the article was about how is entrepreneurship in South Africa about necessity or is it about high impact? Because of the difference between starting a business because you need to put, on the, you need to put food on the table today right. or you're starting a business because you have a vision and a mission and something innovative that you want to present to the world. And if you go around townships or rural areas, you'll see people, you know, starting their spaza shop or starting this hair salon. But majority of that is driven by the need to, you know, really buy, buy food and, and feed your family or take your siblings to school or really just cope with the rising um, levels of, of, of 
you know, items in, in, in shops and keeping up with inflation and all of that. And so it's a very, very complex thing. Um, I, I wouldn't be so hasty to rush and say, you know, people are lazy or they don't get it. Mm -hmm. I believe that there's always a root cause to something. And for generations on end, I think if you look at how we functioned as a racial group, given the context of apartheid, there is definitely a, a, a sort of ominous um, backdrop to, to everything that shapes the way we react and behave in certain situations. And until the, the, you know, for as long as there's still a family somewhere in South Africa that's still trying to put food on the table, that's still trying to cope with gender-based violence and crime and so many socioeconomic factors, it's going to be very hard for that person to want to now think of becoming the next Mark Zuckerberg. You know, um, I think that Mark, um, and I think Maslow's hierarchy of needs are so, so relevant to the type of society that we live in today because, I mean, 3 million people have lost their jobs in just 2020. Um, you know, from, from COVID-19. Let me think that if you take Maslow's hierarchy of needs and use it to analyze South Africa, if majority of people are still in poverty and in their day-to-day, -day, they're still trying to fight off violence and, and poverty and lack and just all of these things that affect how we operate and the confidence levels that we have to become entrepreneurs, then we're still going to have a very small portion of, you know, Black elites that profits off of capitalism and, 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 and the market economy that we have. Um, so it's definitely a responsibility that we have to ensure that we create our environments that are conducive to people wanting to become our entrepreneurs. Because sometimes you need to sell someone the bigger picture. If you yeah. can show them the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, the Steve Jobs of the world, the, um, you know, the, the Jeff Bezos of the world, then somehow they can see themselves in those people. But if you're, if you're just going to you go to someone or, 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 or whether in a township or rural area who don't, who aren't even receiving a proper education, yeah. you know, they won't they get it. And I think that's, that's why sometimes I get very disappointed in our governments for allowing Think for allowing townships and the conditions that young children learn in in schools remain the same way as they were in apartheid because that stifled creativity. And yes, it's important for someone to go out and search knowledge for themselves because ultimately you are the only person who's, who's responsible for your own life. No one is going to make success for you. But we cannot ignore the fact that sometimes environments are created that make it hard for someone to want to even aspire to them that or make them unaware of the possibilities that exist in the world. I mean, the other day, I was um, in a community called e um here in, in Hillcrest. Um, and I was so, so just taken aback by the conditions that Amanda Batlana Kona live in. Um, and it's not too far off from Hillcrest. Literally, when you, Hillcrest is a, it's a very, um, elite upper class area of Durban and as soon as you drive camp at least 15 minutes from Inland Road away you automatically enter Molweni and there are no resources there the schools there still look like what they were back in apartheid and you can see that you know the black people they are conditioned are, are subject to some conditions that really will ensure that generations that come afterwards still live in those conditions and we were actually I was, I was driving with my mom because we were delivering um, a few items for a event that we we're sponsoring um, I also run an NPO and so we were helping out with wow. that and to get to the venue that we were going to we actually had to cross um, a road that had a river and the water was flowing all around the road um, and mind you, this is a route that Ingans are going to have to take on their way to school. They still have to cross rivers to get to school. Yeah. Um, they still have to walk up mountains and, and umgago that are still unpaved, literally upuku. That's yeah. what some children in this day and age still have to endure. So if you think that you're going to take that person and tell them to invent, you know, the next app when they've never even used a computer or, uh, you know, a, a proper cell phone, then we're really gonna we're gonna be ensuring that the inequality that we have in this country is gonna continue for years on end. But I think you know it's overwhelming when you look at the big situation. You might just want to like give up and say, "Yo, okay, what am I gonna do to assist?" 
Mm. But I think, you know, what you can, what everyone in this country can do is to ensure that whatever they do makes the life of the next person easier. Mm. You're constantly exposing people to opportunities um, mm. and you're doing your bit to empower those around you. Because I, I believe that before you can change the world, you need to change the small circle that you have around you. You need to start with umka or wako. You need to start yeah. with, you know, before you get to the entire South Africa. So in the times that when you do get to interact with young people in your community, you know, tell them about new inventions that are being made. Tell them about careers, whether it's in politics or economics or engineering. Mm. Um, and somehow you won't hit every target, but you'll definitely start with one person and that person will pass it on to the next person. It's going to take it's going to take a long time. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to be unrealistic and say we can change it in 10 years. But I think that the more we try and we make a concerted effort, the more there will be young people who are curious enough to know about entrepreneurship and what it is about and the opportunities that it can expose you to. Um, and I definitely don't think we can rely on the generations that have come before us because they come from a different era. We have yeah. so many opportunities at our disposal. And I probably only learned a lot more about entrepreneurship and business um, when I started studying at WITS because I'm doing a, I'm doing a BCom degree there and I've learned so much about how corporations work um, and that's made me more curious to study um, American entrepreneurs as well um, and investors people like Ray Dalio or David Rubenstein and that's all through education and mind you getting that education in the first place for me was a challenge because I'm not from um, a rich family, um, normal yeah. middle-class family. And so with my parents selling, we wouldn't be able to afford you know, education at VITS. Uh, but through working hard and, and getting a bursary, I've been able to do that. But even that just shows you how it's the little things that, that prevent us from accessing you know, that knowledge. Yeah, and right. so I've definitely ensured that um, the opportunities that I've received, I don't take them for granted and I use them to empower other people around me. Um, and hopefully it inspires other young people as well to want to become entrepreneurs. Yeah, for unpacking all of this. It has been yeah. an eye-opening for me. Uh, I, mm. I, you know, all these things, and I'm agreeing because <laughs> These are the core issues that we are dealing with in our society. And it, yeah. it's so sad that we can't talk about entrepreneurship. We can't talk about any other thing other than solving inking as clothing, water, and food. So those are the mm. real issues that we are facing. So I need to move yeah. now to the other business. Um Tell, tell me about Amasomi uh, Productions. So you are writing, yeah. so you are writing pieces there, and I, I, I like the fact that you are you are touching on, you know, the core stories, the real stories that I think people need to hear more of. Such, uh, you know, when you're talking about gender-based violence, it's what we are currently facing in the world. Uh, not only in South Africa, by the way, because people think gender violence is only happening in South Africa or in Africa. It's happening around the world. Um, yeah. Although now in South Africa, it's only getting, you know, uh, in media mind, it's getting attention now, but it has been yeah. happening. Our parents have gone through the same thing, like it's been there for a very long time. So tell me more about the, the Amasomi production and ultimately what are you aiming to achieve with it? Yeah, so if you haven't guessed, it comes from um, my surname, Somi, hence yeah. Amasomi Productions. Right. Um, and for me, that's, that's, that's really a space that I want to, to see becoming a platform for people to learn information. I want everyone who interacts with a piece of content that we produce to say, 
hmm, I didn't think of it that way. Or, you know, I've never heard it being said that way. Um, you know, so that, that's, that's the ultimate impact that I want an individual to experience if ever they read a blog or watch an interview that we do, you know. Um, but I was really inspired to start Amazon Productions when I was actually listening to um, Tyler Perry speak right. about his journey um, as a filmmaker and, and as an entrepreneur himself. And he said that... Um, he obviously grew up in a very, very painful, painful household with an abusive father and, and poverty and, 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 you know, so many situations that could have prevented anyone from accumulating the amount of success that he has. And he spoke about how he once heard Oprah talk about how writing things down can be cathartic for you, um, just meaning that it can be a release you know, for all of your emotions and for yeah. you to somehow find a way to articulate how you feel. And then it got me thinking, I, I thought about how if Oprah hadn't started her platform, if she hadn't done the Oprah Winfrey show um, and all the other shows she's done, mm -hmm. maybe we wouldn't have had a Tyler Perry, you know, maybe we wouldn't have watched all the Medea movies and laughed and cried and experienced so many different stories. Um, and it made me realize that sometimes you merely living in your purpose and doing the things that you're destined to do is not about you, but it unlocks someone else's future who's also going to do well. And I can personally attest to the fact that there's so many Oprah shows that I've watched and podcasts that I've listened to that have encouraged me at times when I feel demotivated or feel like I don't have purpose that have encouraged me to get back up. You know, so yeah. that's when I realized the power of content, the power of stories and the power of um, using our voices to advocate for something greater than ourselves. Um, and realizing that inspired me to say, okay, let me start my production company as well, you know, and let me start making content that um, inspires people and forces people to think in different ways about different things. Um, yeah. And I personally, for the longest time, I've always been confused about why you know, African movies are made, at, but they're acted out by American actors or British actors. I've always, be, I, I watched the um, Nelson Mandela movie back in 2013, where Idris Elba was the main character. Yeah, yeah. And in my mind, I was asking myself, couldn't they get South African to act out Nelson Mandela, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's those small things that I constantly look at and I say, we can do better than this and we can achieve a higher level of excellence than this. Yeah. Um, and I took all of that and observations and said, okay, let me start a production company um, and let me start with what I have. Cause I'm gonna be honest right now, we don't have a, a elaborate set with lights and, and cameras and all of those things. I am merely starting with what I have. My first video literally started with me using my cell phone. I type out my, my articles and my team types out our articles, you know, from our computers. And that's literally all we do. And so I don't want people to think that, you know, right now Amazon Productions has a full on set that's worth a million rand. It doesn't start like that. I just start small, you know, with what I have and grow from that. Um, so with using, you know, the resources that we have available, um, Amazon Productions is really a space um, for creating content that inspires people and that tells um, our stories in our own ways. And I mean, as, 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 as the year goes by and the future goes by, there's definitely more projects that we're going to be taking on. Um, for me personally, I've always wanted um, to see, um, I don't know if you know, Ian Piazza Sandran, um, yeah. the battle that the Zulus had with the British yeah, yeah, yeah. back in the 1800s. Yeah. Um, that's one like story that I'm upset. I only read books about it. I'm always watching videos on it. And that's one project that I've marked. And I said, one day I want to see my company produce a movie, you know, on that with South Africans, by South Africans, mm. um, and, and showcase our stories. And that's that's the type of you know storytelling that I want to do. And, and so we do many things from talk shows to, to writing and blogs. I'm soon going to be doing documentaries and other forms of content, but it's it's really just unlocking the stories that we haven't been telling and bringing it out to South Africans um, and hopefully to the world. Wow, yo, you are doing <laughs> so much. I'm so inspired right now. Like I'm literally <laughs> very, very inspired. Um. Okay, so tell me what it has been your downfall like your biggest failure in life and how did you come back from that? The reason why I asked this yeah. question 
that is where we really get to know the person and their strength you know because in their you know their downfall that where you know you get you get to see the real character that's where you get to see the real people you know they say we we learn more when we uh, uh you know when we're in difficult situations that's where we learn more so i always yeah. ask this question with an intention that i know that there are people who are now looking like myself i'm, I'm very inspired by everything that you have said thus far and and i can see that this person is dead destined for success in life so but definitely you had your own down, downfalls i want to know what they are if you may share yeah them. yeah i mean i've definitely had so many moments that were character defining um and moments that have made me feel like i'm inadequate or i don't feel like i have the strength to really get up and do all the things i want to do i think the biggest battle for me, um, right from when I was young, even still today, has been self-doubt a lot. Um, self-doubt has prevented me from even starting Amazon Productions sooner than I than than I have. Um, because these things are, you always have these ideas every day of the business you want to start or a new project you want to do. But sometimes the only people that that get in our way is us. You know, sometimes you don't feel like we measure up, you don't feel like we're confident enough to do it, you don't feel like we have the skills or the capital to do it. And so I've had to fight against myself for such a long time, right from primary and high school. Um, right now you're seeing a very confident, you know, young woman speaking to you, but it hasn't always been the case. You know, I, I definitely, um, suffered from a very, very low self-esteem and low self-confidence um, all throughout high school, always comparing myself to other people, always thinking that I wasn't good enough or I couldn't do that. Um, I judge myself so, so harshly. Um, I wouldn't think I'm skilled enough to do it. Um, but the only thing that made a difference was that I would do it anyway, sort of as a way to try and tell the weakness in its face that I'm not going to let this weakness, you know, get me down. But for the longest time, I definitely, you know, dealt with self-doubt and constantly questioning myself, you know, am I worthy? Am I skilled enough? And, and, and you know, can I pull off this project? I mean, I remember um, before, like, I officially started Amazon Productions, I called a friend of mine and I was on the phone with her and I was telling her, I am so anxious. I don't feel like I can do this. I don't have the resources to do this. And right now I just think I'm dreaming way too big. And you know what, maybe I should just pack it up and just focus on my schoolwork and the finance gym and just pack it up in a corner and call it a day. I literally said that to her. And that was a moment when I really, really felt like I, could, I couldn't do this and I didn't have the strength to do it, you know? Um, but as time goes by, you sort of, go against the grain and you fight against yourself. So I think for any entrepreneur that's watching this, the main thing that they must look at is themselves and ask themselves, right. you know, how do I view myself right now? Am right. I confident? Do I have a high self-esteem? Can I stand headstrong in the vision that I have and not be distracted by things or people? Because those are the sole things that lead to the fall of a person. Um, right. Yes, it can be something that happens outside of yourself, but I love spending the time to really perform a surgery on myself and look at myself and see, you know, should I improve in this area or do I still have self-doubts? Because um, you need to invest more in yourself than you invest on anything else that you do because everything else that you do comes from yourself. You know, so that that's the you know that's the main thing that I want people to know. Um, never look at entrepreneurs or people who are successful and think that you know they have everything perfect. They they really they really don't. Um, sometimes a person may be on stage and they may be nervous out of this world, but you won't see it because they themselves are trying to to to. Um, program program themselves in their mind to stand there confidently and while to everyone else they look like they aren't scared or you know they're totally confident they may be fighting you know their own inner battles so for me that's just been one thing of, of always investing in myself knowing that you know as a teenager i was very very insecure but 
growing into my own my own strength and power has definitely helped me to curb that weakness um and i guess i mean i haven't always had an easy life definitely not i mean just recently um i, I realized that my funding for my final year of study this year has been cut off and i've been funded by um NASFIS. and all of a sudden in my third year they decided to just cut off my funding um, and so that's been a really really big challenge for me because i haven't been at the space yet where i can fully afford to pay for my vids fees um, and it's it's not something that you know I complain about every day and say, oh, woe is me, life is tough. And yes, life is tough and these things happen. Um, and and I definitely love sharing that, you know, with people who ask me about my journey because these are things that drive me to actually put in more effort into my businesses. Um, it's not only provide for my family and for myself, but to say that in spite of these challenges, like not having funding and, and fighting against myself, I still made it. Um, so, you know, life hasn't been easy. It's definitely been a case of, you know, life throwing lemons at you and making lemonade. But at the end of the day, I think that our weaknesses and our low moments are there to make us grow. Um, it's, I, I think I've only ever, tapped into a new level of myself after um, after a heartbreak, after a disappointment, after a failure. That's when you know I'm forced to grow. And so any entrepreneurs listening to this, I want them to know that the challenge that they face now, it's nothing compared to the lesson that is behind the challenge. And if you just spend every day investing in yourself and investing in yourself doesn't mean going to buy a new dress or buying a car or it's not about that it's about you you know looking at yourself in the mirror to say you know what are my strengths what are my weaknesses and what do I need to develop to get to where I want to be absolutely yeah tell me about the books that you have read do you have three books that you have read that have inspired your life that have shaped you to be the person that you are today so I I'm, I read quite a variety of books from business to um, politics, economics to personal development um, and history as well. Um, but I will say that the books that have like really really stood out for me, I think the first one is a book by Robin Sharma called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. I'm sure I'm sure you've heard of it, or maybe your listeners know yeah. it. Robin Sharma is just an amazing author overall. The way he's able to use stories to teach you more about yourself is incredible. I read the Marcus Holders Ferrari. I think about when I was very very young, back in high school, around grade ten. My mom had it in the house, and I was bored, so I read the book. <laughs> But I didn't know that I would read a book that would really inspire me and teach me from a young age what really matters. Um, and for you know those who haven't read the book, the book is basically about this you know corporate lawyer who's doing very very well, but he ends up neglecting his own health and and um, wellness and just investing in himself for for the sake of his career, and then he ends up moving all the way to the East and the Himalayas and learning from the monks about what it looks like to live a balanced and, and happy life. And so the lessons that I learned from that book about how and uh, learning, uh, living rather, uh, a whole life is not necessarily about money, but it's about having a solid understanding of yourself and knowing that your sense of self-worth and being doesn't necessarily come from the things you have, but they come from who you are. And that's why we see a lot of people in this day and age who are successful, but they are unhappy, unhappy or they maybe have health challenges or they're unfit or they just have an area in their life that's still not in balance with everything else. Um, and up until you learn to learn how to, uh, up until you learn to balance everything and know yourself and have a strong understanding of yourself, then I think you can have a happy life. And so that book taught me from a very, very young age to always, while I aspire um, to, to live a higher quality of life financially, I must also always aspire to live a higher quality of life um, within myself, within my family, my friendships, my health, and every other aspect of my life. So very, very um, highly recommended book, I would say. Yeah. Um, second book um, that I have read that has really, really um, inspired me is Think and Grow Rich. 
um, I think that book is so like pivotal to anyone who wants to know the secrets to building, you know, wealth in yeah. their in their life. Um, I also read that book quite frankly at a young age, and so I definitely am going to reread it because I think there's definitely a lot more things that I can get out from it at this phase of my life. But um, it's such an incredible book and so many lessons that Napoleon Hill teaches one. Um, he goes through like the different um, principles that you need to, to learn in order to acquire wealth. And it, it just touches on the fact that wealth starts in your thoughts and it starts in your mind. Um, and tying it in with financial literacy, I think one needs to have the desire to want to make a lot of money to make it. It has to start with the thoughts. And in our community, the biggest place that we must start with is the mind. We need to empower the mind um, and, and, and unlock all of the different paradigms that have been shaped for so many years. And I think for anyone who wants to start learning how they can not only empower themselves financially, but just overall in their lives, I think Think and Grow Rich is an amazing um, book that you know people should get out there and read. And I think um, the third book that has um, inspired me a lot um, is a book that I read last year about a um, young lady from Nepal who was human trafficked. Um, very, very sad book, um, but it did inspire me to want to continue creating content that addresses societal problems and that um, forces people to, to really be accountable for how society functions and for us to create a, a just society for all people. But it's a book titled um, Radhika's Story, um, Surviving the Shackles of Human Trafficking, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it's a book that talks about her journey um, from being um, abducted in Nepal, where she was born, and she was human trafficked in India, and she became a sex worker from 13 all to around 19 years old. Um, and in those ages, she was abused. She was made to marry one of her kidnappers. She had a child and she lived a very, very painful life. And so for me, it was a glimpse into that space um, and to learn more about it. And then it's actually inspired me to write more on it, to continue advocating for young women in those spaces. Um, mm -hmm. And to also be conscious of the fact that in this world, there are so many things that happen and reading is so essential for you to know what it is that happens so that you can find what you want to attach your voice to. Because there right. may be some entrepreneurs here who maybe don't want to necessarily be an entrepreneur, but they want to be a social entrepreneur. And so if you want to know what cause to stand up for, read, watch the news, watch documentaries and see what cause you can attach your voice to. And so um, very different three books, but I think um, for anyone who, who has different callings in life, those three books could definitely help with unlocking that. Right. Um, and then who are the people who inspire you in life? The people that you look yeah. up to? Three people. I think, yeah, I think firstly, my mom. My mom really inspires me um, to, to always be compassionate um, and to always try and understand people. Uh, my parents are the polar opposites. My dad is like very just like strict and you know, things go this way and that way. But my mom, she's very, she takes the time to listen and try and understand your point of view and, and, and come up with a solution that fits your problem in its entirety. And that has helped me a lot in all of my endeavors from Amazon Productions to um, the finance gym because in our research that we do at the finance gym, um, we don't just look at financial literacy and say, you know, okay, this is the problem, this is the solution. You have to take the time to have the compassion to understand why people behave the way they do and then come up with a solution that fits that. So my mom has definitely inspired me to be more compassionate and understanding towards other people um, so that I can directly touch people's lives and not feel like I'm imposing, you know, my view yeah. or solution onto them. Um, Second person that has inspired me, um, I would definitely, definitely say is Steve Biko. Um, he was such a revolutionary man. And I wish 
that you know in the 1970s and 80s he would have gotten the credit that he that he deserves because um if if ever there was a time for black consciousness and for young black people to understand their power it is now and then i always try to look for a reference point um for someone who can sort of give me an idea of what that looks like. I always, you know, refer to either speeches he's given or books that he's read, um, written rather. So he definitely inspires me to continue to ensure that everything that I do serves the Black community. I mean, of course, I, I am tolerant and, and, and embracing of every other race, but I understand the complexities of the Black you know, race. And so I'm always going to be an advocate for Black empowerment and consciousness um, and development in our spaces. And I think the third person um, that has definitely inspired me a lot will definitely be the one and only Oprah Winfrey. Um, yeah. Her story of how she survived the challenges in her life and to building the empire that she's had, that she's built now, um, and being, you know, a black woman in America. And America is not a friendly space for black people. But the fact that, you know, she has been able to build an empire and create content that has touched the lives of so many people, that in itself, you know, inspires me. And it, it reassures me every day that the stories that I want to tell, they matter. Because when you start out with a production company, you aren't that famous, you you know don't have that many numbers, but you need to have that in inward belief in you that you know the story that I'm gonna put out or the blog that I'm gonna write, it matters and it's gonna touch someone. Even if it doesn't, at least I've stated, you know, how I, I wish to see things being viewed. And so um, seeing her growth as an entrepreneur and as a female um, in her space has really inspired me to continue to keep producing content um, and to always do things with a purpose and intention. Uh, so in closing, um, what would you say to someone who is a student who wants to tap into entrepreneurship? That's number one. Number two, what would you say to the student who has a problem with their finances? Number three, mm -hmm. we do know, me and you, we know that there are students who are really struggling in residences or, you know, in higher education because their parents cannot really, you know, afford a lot of things that other students, you know, they have a privilege of. Um, you know, if I can tap into my story a little bit there, I'm one of the students who was, you know, disadvantaged. Uh, I didn't have many things that I wanted to have in high, in, in a tertiary university or in a tertiary institution. Yeah. So I was really, really struggling, but you know, I, I made it. So what would you say to these three people, the people who are struggling in life, uh, you know, financially, who also wants to step into entrepreneurship and generally to people who are struggling in the, you know, in the universities and colleges. Yeah, so I'll start with um, those who went to, who are struggling with entrepreneurship. I don't know how to go about tackling, you know, entrepreneurship. Um, I first want to demystify the whole idea of entrepreneurship because sometimes people think that the entrepreneur is the person with, you know, the big office. It's the person with huge contracts. Um, and if you don't have that, you're not necessarily an entrepreneur. Um, those people need to know that inside themselves, they have something to offer to the world. Sometimes it's through entrepreneurship, sometimes it's through entrepreneurship. So if you're in a company right now, or if you're working a job, you can innovate in that job, or it could be as an employee using your gift and talents in exchange for your time and you know getting money for that. So people need to know that everything that they need is inside of themselves, firstly, because sometimes I think a lot of people that I've interacted with simply don't see themselves as entrepreneurs. They don't think of themselves in that light, but you need to begin to think of yourself in that way. And the first thing I'd say to those people is um, look at yourself and see what is it about you. Um, I think Bonang once said this. She said, what is it about you that you can bottle up and sell to someone? And it could wow. literally be fun personality. Um, and that could be through doing a show. 
producing content through um you know starting starting an entertainment center you know if you're someone who loves numbers um and you're passionate about reading financial statements about businesses you you know after graduating could easily start your own consultancy firm or or come up with your own ways of putting uh, you know entrepreneurship in action and so people never need to really reach outside of themselves to be an entrepreneur you simply need to look at what you are good at and what you have and then go about finding the people that can teach you how to turn that into enterprise. Um, if you can't get a physical mentor, read books, read books on business. Um, if you need to take a book on, on how to, you know, do cost accounting, get that book from the library and read it so you can get the skills, you know, that you need to do that. Um, and then secondly, I'd say to that same group as well, is um, that Sometimes in life, you need to open up your eyes to the capital that you have. Um, and I love T.D. Jakes. He once said something so powerful. He said, God doesn't give you a chair. God gives you a tree. And it is your responsibility to turn that tree into a chair. And we have too many people that are praying for chairs, praying for the company, praying for money, but they haven't looked around to see what do they have around them that they can turn into the first stepping stones of that business. You know, so I say to you know any student that is struggling with entrepreneurship is, you know, literally make a, make a list of everything that you have and say, how can I take this little form of capital and turn it into something profitable? And you might not start off, start off big, but you will start. And it's just about starting and carrying on and being consistent with that. Um, please do repeat the, the second category of people that you want me to address. The people who are struggling um, in the university, yeah, you know they are studying towards their qualifications, but they are finding it very difficult, you know, to keep going because of financial issues mm. or maybe mental mm -hmm. issues. Like yeah. there are so many psychosocial like, issues that the students are dealing with. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm asking this question because you're also a student, and yeah. I think they can relate, you know, to your story as well. Yeah. So what did you just say to those students? Yeah, to students, I would definitely say that understand that everything happens for a reason. The very fact that you even made it to that university is a testament to the amount of potential that is in you. Because when you're in matric, we fantasize about going to university and we're so excited about it. And then the minute we get there, we start to become depressed, we start to become um, stressed and, and, and some people even commit suicide because they can't deal with it. But we, we need to always remember that you are there for a reason. And you must never forget that that reason is bigger than yourself. As I was saying, the first thing that we must always remember, especially as young black people who don't come from rich households, is that us getting to that university in itself is a miracle. Um, it took so many generations of people to sacrifice, to even die, um, to deprive themselves so that we could be educated and empowered. And so if ever there's a day where we doubt to Uti, Yo, or, you know, this is too difficult, or I can't do this. Remembering the fact that you being there is a miracle is something that has personally kept me going. I remember when we were still back on campus, obviously, I was walking past a great hall, AS events, um, basically where all of the graduations take place and it's 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 quite a spectacle my yuga and in my mind i just thought of how literally these each brick was laid by black people who were made to be slaves or who were exploited for their time um, and who who were abused all generations yes it was designed by colonial powers but the actual building of each brick um, was was made by black people who came before us and for years those universities were you know obviously some universities have different policies but education is something only accessible to those who are privileged by systems that came before us and i was thinking in my mind we would see what a 360 degree moment we would see i'm actually able to walk you know these these grounds and it was something that you know my grandparents and even my parents couldn't do um, and that in itself was a privilege and i would never want to let that go and um, even in the face of no more funding or you know not being able to have resources 
courses that I need to, to get that qualification. And so the biggest thing that I think, you know, every student should keep in mind is that um, them being here is not a mistake, it's a miracle. And by you completing what you started, you won't only be helping yourself, but you'll be helping the communities um, that you come from, because now what they need is one nail that they can look at and say, yeah, well, if they, if they could do it, Nami, I could do it. And then I think, um, obviously, when it comes to, to the difficulties of getting an education in this country, if you're from a middle um, or lower income household, um, we can't deny that. Um, there's times when, you know, you have to either get a secondhand book, there's times that you need to budget and, and you know, not buy certain things to even have food every day um, if yeah. you live at risk. So it, it is difficult. I'm not going to, you know, stand up here and say you must, you know, work hard and, and be the superhuman um, because it's sad that other students, you know, drive to campus in cars and, and they get yeah. to... to Know, live life easier um, and those are the realities of, 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 of the situation of, of the times in which we live in but I always say that always looking yourself at a victim already disqualifies you from the race of being successful um, and this is something that just trans it transcends the student community it goes back to our own communities and our country as a whole and um, for so long we've looked at our as victims and yes we have been victims but I think the more you wear your story on you as a badge of honor the more you will fuel that that difficult situation that you're in and so obviously I'm not going to be ignorant but I do think that um, the more we move from being victims to more of being victors and owning our pain and taking that and turning it into something greater and bigger um, is something that will help at least shift our mindsets towards our issues. Um, and then I think one thing that definitely inspires me as a student and really inspired me to start becoming an entrepreneur while I'm in, in tertiary is looking at my own peers who have started their businesses while in, in university. Um, I have a good friend of mine. Um, she owns an events company and she's um, also doing her, her third year in university. And she does not come from a rich household. She uh, is also a middle, middle to lower income household and everything that she has had she has had to work for it on her own and so when I heard her story and how you know she knew that if she wanted to you know drive a car at an early age or you know be able to to finance her study she needed to do something and so she started an events company and she's been so successful at it her business has grown in leaps and bounds and so I looked at that and I was like really inspired and I said okay if she could do that then I can clearly do something as well and what always is helpful is that if you are studying something that is linked with a place where you can become an entrepreneur, you automatically have the, the insights and the resources that you need to develop a well sustainable businesses. So I always encourage students to always have a side hustle, you know, always do something on the side while you're still studying, whether you, you get a job, whether you start your own business and you sell something online or on campus, do that and, and do the little that you can with, like, with what you have, you know, to support yourself because, um, it's not going to be easy at all, but it's about finding solutions to your problem that will really leave you empowered. Um, if you sit and wait for someone to rescue you, unfortunately, that won't happen. There is there is no rescue um, that you can get. You are the person you have been waiting for, and so that you know that's what I would say to a student to always remember um, that we are the ones that we have been waiting for. And if ever there's a time when things are difficult and you find you, you find yourself in a situation where you don't have funding or you go to campus without food and, 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 and anything of that sort. Acknowledge that it is difficult, but also remember the power that you have within you to spin any situation that, that life throws at you and turn it you know, into something, something big and profitable. And also tuning in to other people's stories, young people. As I said, the friend of mine has her own events company. That inspired me. I also did an interview. I interviewed um, a very successful entrepreneur um, who runs an online business. And in his first year at VITS, his funding actually got cut off a week after he registered. Um, automatically, his funding was cut off and he had no way to finance his studies because 
his family was not going to be, you know, his source of, of funding. And so he realized the situation and he automatically started um, his company. And what he, what he does is basically sell luxury watches and items online to people who want to buy that. And he started that and now he's grown it. Um, and I think an article that was published um, not too long ago, like told the story and reported that his business is now making lots and lots of money, over 500K. Um, and that's that's a lot of money, you know, for, for a young black person. Um, so when I heard that story was, as well, I was like, okay, you know, no matter what happens, I can still be fine because people who've, who've gone before me and people who are my age have proven that, you know, you can do anything in clubbing that you put your mind to. So may those people be motivated by other people's stories um, realize that you being there, being in university is a miracle and don't take that for granted um, and always find a way to use what you have to turn it into something bigger. And indeed, it is a privilege to be in the higher institutions. There are thousands and thousands of people who really want the opportunity to be students in one of the universities in South Africa, but it's yeah. not possible. Uh, thank you so much, Sandy, for being with us today. I cannot thank you enough. I've learned so much from you. And, you know, you have inspired me you have taught me so much and thank you so much once again for your time and yeah man i hope to hear more and more of these stories in Tampa in the near future yes would yeah. you are still going to come and and bless us and bless us with your presence tell us in progress we want to know what you come back and we finance gym we also want to know what you how's how's things we for Amazon production. I think you are doing so And come again there. I'll say the next time we talk, I would have produced a movie. So trust yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm getting his Yeah. Yeah, I know. I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> so yeah, no, thank, thank you. No, thank you so much. much for having me on your platform. Thank you. It's an honor. Sure. Um, every time I'm, I'm invited to speak, I don't take it granted. Um, and thank you. And I wish you all the best as well with your podcast. The work you're doing is amazing. And because someone's going to listen to this and it's going to change their lives. So you should be proud of yourself as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So where can we get hold of you on, on the socials? or maybe the contact details of the company, where can we get hold of yeah. you guys? So people can reach me personally, um, if they want to via Instagram, my handle is at star and me. You can just send me a DM and if you are engaged on anything or ask me questions, that's totally fine. And then when it comes to my businesses, um, you can go to the Finance Gym website. Our website is www.thefinancegym.co.za and there you can find all of our content from our blogs um, and soon our other content that we roll out as well. And as well, you can follow us on Instagram at the finance gym, um, as well as on Facebook um, at the finance gym. And then um, for Amazon Productions, you can find our first project online, Candid Conversations. That's the website that we post our articles on. Um, you can find us on Instagram at Candid Conversations um, underscore ZA. And then you can go to our website as well. Um, and the link to our website will be on our Instagram page. And there you can see all of the work that we do. Um, I'm also available on LinkedIn. Um, that's where you actually contacted me. Uh, so you can share yeah. message on LinkedIn as well. And you can definitely talk um, from, from there. Okay, no problem. Thank you so much, uh, Standiwe. Nami, I will also leave your details in the video in, and in the description. But thank you so much for your time. Thank All you. the best with everything that you're doing. Thank you. Okay.